Hey, Accounting 205 students. I hope you're all doing well. I'm going to lecture on Chapter 6, Variable Costing and Segment Reporting. Um, I'll tell you, it's kind of an interesting chapter. It circles back and touches on some topics that we discussed way back at the beginning. Um, but then it's also kind of a mishmash of other random topics toward the end of the chapter. But we will work through it and have you well prepared for the week. So variable costing and segment reporting. So we've been spending a lot of time talking about variable costing. Um, we need to understand how variable costing differs from absorption costing and be able to compute our unit product cost under each method. So you know when we say absorption costing, um, that's also somewhat synonymous to traditional method, traditional costing as opposed to variable. Um, variable where we're looking at cost behavior. We're separating out our variable expenses and our fixed expenses, whereas absorption is traditional where we take sales minus COGS equals gross margin, and then we subtract our selling and admin expenses to arrive at net income. So we will compare the two different methods. Um, first, we've got three big, broad, sweeping assumptions to deal with in this chapter. Um, this chapter is using actual costing rather than normal costing approach that was used in job order costing chapters. Um, so that's a little bit different, but I suppose in terms of financial accounting, that's what we're used to, that our actual costs are what get recorded, not what we expect the cost to be, which is normal costing. Um, second assumption, um, in this chapter, we're using the actual number of units produced as the allocation base for assigning actual fixed MO to products. So we're using the actual number of units produced as our allocation base. Um, in the real world, that may not happen. That would take some pretty good estimating to achieve that. And then thirdly, this chapter always assumes that the variable manufacturing cost per unit and the total fixed manufacturing overhead cost per period remain constant. Uh, not to say that they couldn't be changed, but that they're remaining steady over the period that we're examining at least. So those are our three big assumptions. Um, and like we know in managerial accounting, um, we have to make certain amounts of assumptions. Again, we're focused on relevance and timeliness rather than accuracy and precision. Uh, so it's okay to make some assumptions for the sake of having good information to make decisions. So the quick overview, variable versus absorption. Under variable costing, which we've been studying the last couple chapters, our product cost is our direct materials, direct labor, and our variable MO. And then we have our period costs, meaning the costs that we just expense in the period in which they're incurred. And we consider that to be our fixed MO, our variable selling and admin, and our fixed selling and admin. When it comes to MO, that's really where the difference is between these two methods. How do we treat fixed MO is really the crux of the matter. We've been talking about this since I think back in chapter one or two, the idea that all of the costs that it takes to manufacture a product, um, a lot of them end up going into MO, manufacturing overhead. And some of them are really big numbers, numbers like uh, your rent or lease on your factory, your utilities, your insurance, property taxes, um, there's a lot of big numbers that potentially would be fixed MO. And what they're telling us here is that variable costing is now saying, you know what, that's okay. Those expenses actually could be considered belonging to that time period as opposed to being attached to each unit of product. Where absorption costing says, no, 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 all of the fixed MO belongs to the product. Uh, it's a product cost. It's part of the cost of producing what we make here, and therefore we're going to attach it to each unit of product. And we've talked about this concept in the past. So if we produce a bunch of units of product, 
and we don't sell them by the end of the period. They remain as inventory, an asset on our balance sheet at the end of the period. Do you think it feels like an asset to have lease on our factory space and insurance and property taxes on our factory wrapped up as inventory, as an asset on our balance sheet? A lot of people would argue that that's not an asset, that that was an expense of the corresponding period and it shouldn't remain as an asset on the balance sheet. So that's the big difference between variable costing versus absorption costing is how do we treat fixed MO and where do we put it? And it's a good argument. Do we just expense it in the period that it belongs to or do we attach it to each unit of product? What, we're, what we'll find out is that there's a time and a place for each method. Um, in terms of internal decision making, uh, variable costing is probably going to be more useful to us, where absorption costing is more widely used for financial reporting. Uh, but we're going to look at how to approach both and what those differences will be. So, quick check for those of you with short-term memory loss. Which method will produce the highest values for WIP and finished goods inventories? Which one will result in rolling up more into our inventory asset? I'm hoping you know the answer here. Did you guess A, absorption costing? That's right, because if we go back, that fixed MO is gonna be rolled up into our inventories to the extent that we don't sell them. So that's how we come up with absorption costing. So here we're looking at Harvey Company. Um, they produce a single product and we have the following information. We've got 25,000 units produced annually we have variable costs that include direct materials, direct labor, and the variable MO. All of that adds up to $10 per unit. And we have selling and admin expenses at $3 per unit. Our fixed costs include manufacturing overhead, 150,000, and we have selling and admin expenses of 100,000. So they've neatly organized this for us by cost behavior, variable versus fixed, um, but we've also mixed together, we've got product cost here, and we have product cost here as MO, our fixed MO is still a product cost. And then we have our selling and admin variable, selling and admin fixed. So in terms of thinking about variable costing versus absorption costing, um, we need to compare cost behavior versus a look at product and period cost. So when we think of our unit product cost, under absorption and variable, they're both going to include direct materials, direct labor, and the variable MO, so $10 for sure. And for variable costing, that's it. But under absorption costing, we're going to add in fixed MO. How do we get fixed MO per unit? Well, we're going to take the $150,000 total and divide it up by the 25,000 units produced and we get $6 of fixed MO that's going to attach to each unit of product. Keeping in mind that this amount, the $6, could vary depending on how many units we produce in any given period. What if we only produce two units that period? Should we attach $75,000 of fixed MO onto each product? It sounds kind of silly, right? We'd be in bad shape if we're only producing two units per period. But in theory, that's what absorption costing would call for, that we break up the $150,000 of fixed MO over the units produced. So obviously in this case, we've got 25,000 units, not just two. So it's $6 per unit, and we get a unit product cost of $16 per unit under absorption costing, while variable costing just remains at 10 per unit and we'll plan to expense all 150,000 of our fixed MO. So we're gonna take a look at our income statement using both variable and absorption costing. 
So let's assume that at Harvey Company, 20,000 units were sold during the year at a price of $30 each, and there's no beginning inventory. Do you remember how many units we produced? It was 25,000. So if we produce 25,000 and we sell 20,000, then we're gonna have 5,000 units of ending inventory. So under variable costing, We've got sales, 20,000 times $30 each, $600,000. And then our variable expenses, we take our variable COGS, that's our product cost, 20,000 times $10 of variable product cost, we get $200,000. We have our variable selling and admin expense, 20,000 units times $3 each, that's 60,000. So we have total variable expenses of 260, and therefore a contribution margin of 340,000. Under fixed expenses, we expense all $150,000 of the fixed MO. And then we expense our fixed selling admin at 100,000, and we have total fixed expenses of 250, and therefore a net operating income of 90,000. Now, before we move on to the next slide, I want you to think for a moment. Under variable costing, we're expensing all 150,000 of fixed mo. Are we going to be expensing all 150,000 under the absorption approach? Absorption costing, what are they going to do with the 150,000? Do you think net operating income under absorption is going to be higher or lower? Let's find out. So here it is, absorption costing and our net operating income is higher. Is that what you thought? So again, our sales, 20,000 times $30, nothing changes, $600,000 in sales. Now our cost of goods sold is 20,000 units times $16. So the higher, the, the unit product cost under absorption that includes the fixed mo. So our COGS is 320,000 and therefore our gross margin is 280,000. Then we subtract our selling and admin expenses, the variable 20,000 times $3 each and the fixed selling and admin at 100,000 for a total of 160 and therefore net operating income of 120,000. So why did our net operating income come out higher? And the answer is exactly this fixed MO is being deferred in our inventory. We have ending inventory of 5,000 units and wrapped up in those units is an extra $6 of product cost per unit that didn't get expensed this period. Remember variable costing says, no, 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 all that fixed MO stuff, that's an expense of the period, but absorption costing wants to attach it onto each unit of product and for the units that were sold, they went ahead and expensed it. That's within this $320,000 of COGS up here. But for the units that weren't sold, we're attaching an extra $6 per unit that's just going to hang out as inventory and asset on our balance sheet. So that causes our net operating income to go up by $120,000 and it's deferring $30,000 of costs, of fixed MO costs, into inventory on our balance sheet. So we end up with net operating income actually higher under absorption. So what happens in terms of explaining that difference? So we're gonna reconcile our variable costing and absorption costing and try to understand what that difference is. So. Under absorption, we've got 120,000 of fixed MO that gets expensed into COGS, and the other 30,000 is deferred onto uh, ending inventory on our balance sheet. All of that adds up to the $150,000 of total fixed MO, and under variable costing, we treat that as an expense of the period and we just expense it directly. So that's what's creating this $30,000 difference is that under absorption, we've expensed only 120 and the other 30,000 is hanging out on the balance sheet. So here they're showing variable costing, 
net operating income at 90,000. And then if we add the fixed MO that's deferred in inventory, 5,000 units times $6 each, that's 30,000. That gives us our absorption costing net operating income of 120,000. And again, remember we got that from taking the fixed MO divided by the units produced. So a key here is that we have this difference because we started with zero beginning inventory and now we're, we're going to end the period with 5,000 units of ending inventory. So our inventory has gone up and we've therefore deferred $6 per unit that's now hanging out as an asset on our balance sheet. What do you think will happen when we sell those 5,000 units? Well, that brings us to year two. So we're gonna find out the answer to that question real quick here. So the number of units produced in year two remains the same at 25,000, but this year we're gonna sell 30,000 units. So we started the period with 5,000 units, we're gonna produce 25,000 more, and then we're gonna sell all of them, all 30,000. And again, the selling price remains the same at 30. The rest of this info remains the same, our direct materials, direct labor, variable MO is $10. We have variable selling and admin at $3. And again, our fixed MO is $150,000 and our fixed selling and admin $100,000. So this time, before I go to the income statements, which one do you think will have higher net operating income? Variable costing or absorption costing? Well, we've got our unit product costs, same as before, same as year one. So absorption costing has $16 per unit and variable costing is only 10 because variable costing is not adding in the $6 per unit. So again, the $6 per unit comes from taking the fixed MO and dividing it up by the units produced. So here's our income statement, variable costing. We're taking 30,000 units times $30 each, that's 900,000. We subtract our variable COGS, 30,000 units times $10 is 300,000. We subtract our variable sell-in and admin, 30,000 units times $3, that's 90,000. So total variables 390, and our contribution margin therefore is 510,000. We subtract all 150,000 of the fixed MO, and then we subtract our fixed selling and admin of 100,000, and we arrive at net operating income of 260,000. So what do you think? Do you think absorption costing is gonna have higher or lower net operating income this time? This time we're releasing units from our inventory and our balance sheet's going to end up with zero ending inventory because we're selling it all off. So it looks like our net operating income now is only 230,000. Is that what you expected? So our income statement, same sales, 30,000 units times $30 is 900,000. Our cost of goods sold now is 30,000 times 16. So the higher $16 unit product cost under absorption, and we get a gross margin of 420,000. Then we subtract our selling and admin, the variable portion, 30,000 times three is 90,000. The fixed portion, 100,000. And we arrive at our net operating income of 230,000. So again, this differs from variable by 30,000, right? Here it was 260,000 under variable. And now our absorption costing net operating income is lower at 230,000. Why? We have a difference of 30,000 again because fixed MO has now been released from inventory. 5,000 units times $6. That extra $6 that is in our absorption product cost within this 16, that extra $6 is now being released from inventory on our balance sheet and creates a greater expense of $30,000 under absorption costing therefore reducing our net operating income by $30,000. So again, we reconcile the difference. Variable costing was 260, while absorption costing came up with 230. 
And that difference explained is now, excuse me, that difference can be explained by deducting our fixed MO that was released from inventory. 5,000 units times $6 per unit is the $30,000 difference. So what we see over the course of two years is overall, it comes out to 350,000 of net income. It washes out after the two year period. And what's notable about this two year period is at the beginning of year one, we had zero inventory. At the end of year one, we had 5,000 units remaining but then at the end of year two, we've then sold off all of the inventory. So once we sell off all of that inventory, all of the fixed MO has been released from inventory on, on the balance sheet, and therefore these numbers all wash out. So it's a timing difference. When do we expense the fixed MO? When it happens or when we sell it? And so under variable costing, we expensed it when it happened, under absorption costing, we expense it when we sell it, which created a difference pushing more expense into the second period when we sold more units. So that's essentially the difference between variable costing and absorption costing. So overall big picture, this chart may not be one that you memorize, but maybe just something to understand. When our units produced equals the units sold, that means that there's no change in our inventory. If we produce 25,000 units and we sell 25,000 units, there's really nothing to talk about here. Absorption and variable would be the same. There would be no difference because we wouldn't be deferring any of the fixed MO into inventory on the balance sheet. However, if our units produced is greater than our units sold, so it, like in year one, we produced 25,000 units but sold only 20,000, that caused our inventory to increase, and therefore under absorption, it deferred $6 of fixed MO into inventory on our balance sheet. So holding extra dollars as an inventory asset as opposed to expensing it under variable costing. So if units produced is greater than units sold, it causes our absorption net income to be higher than variable because under absorption, it's deferring the fixed MO until when we sell those units. Finally, if our units produced is less than our units sold, which would be like year two at Harvey Company, then our inventory is decreasing and therefore releasing fixed MO that is captured as inventory on the balance sheet. And so that'll create greater expenses under absorption than variable, causing our absorption net income to be lower than our variable net income. I want you just to pause for a minute and think about absorption. So if we didn't produce very many units in a given period, earlier I had jokingly suggested, well, what if we only produce two units in the period? That would create a really high product cost, attaching large amounts of fixed MO to each unit of product. So that would be a bit problematic in terms of understanding our true product cost. But going the other direction, what if under absorption, um, what if a business decides to produce tons and tons of units, more than they can sell, and they're just stockpiling, just piles of inventory? So that would be this scenario here where units produced is greater than units sold. What they could do is intentionally overproduce their product and therefore defer much of their fixed MO into a later period and essentially manipulate their net income to look higher, definitely be higher than variable, but simply by producing more units of product, they could manipulate their net income higher. I have to say, I'm skeptical of any accounting method where we can easily manipulate our net income by doing things like producing more units of product with really no purpose. Have you really made more money just by producing more units of product? So the reality is that that would have to be unwound at some point. At some point in time, they'd have to then sell those units and all of that deferred MO would then be released and expensed, but at least temporarily 
they can inflate their net income simply by producing more units of product. For any of you reading the goal, uh, think about what's going on at the factory at the beginning of the book. They're just producing as much as they can and therefore deferring cost to a later period. And what we learn is that's not truly making money. So going back to CVP analysis from chapter five, all of that was centered around variable costing and cost behavior. At the time, we didn't know the difference between variable costing and absorption costing, but variable costing is what allows us to use CVP analysis, cost volume profit analysis from chapter five. So um, we need to use variable costing if we plan to use CVP. Here, because absorption costing assigns fixed MO cost to units produced, so in the case of Harvey Company, the extra $6 per unit, a portion of fixed MO resides in inventory when units remain unsold. The potential result is positive operating income when the number of units sold is less than the break-even point. So going back to what we know from Chapter 5, we know how to compute the break-even point, but what we're finding out here is that if we choose to use absorption costing, it might tell us it very well could result in positive net income even when we're selling less than the break-even. So if you're a manager in the company, that can be pretty confusing and even misleading. Um, certainly, if you're an external reader of the financial statements, that sounds misleading uh, to think that we could have net income that's positive when they're actually selling less than break even according to our CVP analysis. And again, I find it, an accounting method a little bit skeptical if it's allowing for that type of manipulation. I'm definitely concerned about absorption costing and would highly recommend variable costing for internal decision-making purposes, but we're still going to find out that both exist for a reason. So in terms of understanding the changes in our net operating income, variable costing income is only affected by changes in unit sales. And quite honestly, that's the way it seems like it should be. Our Net income changes when we sell more or sell less. It's not affected by the number of units produced. So as a general rule, if sales go up, the net operating income goes up. If sales go down, the net operating income goes down. We can't say the same of absorption costing though. Absorption costing income can be influenced by changes in our unit sales and in our units of production. So if we're not selling much, we could just decide to produce more and that could help our net operating income. So net operating income can be increased simply by producing more units, even if those units are not sold. So we're deferring fixed MO, reducing our current period expenses and deferring those expenses to a later period. Again, I go back to that sounds kind of sketchy if we can manipulate our net income simply by producing more units, which tells me at least for internal decision making, I want to use variable costing. So in terms of our decision making, variable costing correctly identifies the additional variable costs incurred to make one more unit, just $10 per unit. It also emphasizes the impact of our total fixed costs on our profits. So again, separating by cost behavior helps us understand what it costs to make a unit and what our fixed costs mean overall to our profits and to our break even point if we're going to go back and look at CVP analysis. Because absorption costing assigns fixed MO to our units produced, so again that's $6 per unit for Harvey Company, it gives the impression that fixed MO is variable with respect to the number of units produced, but we already know that it's not. It's fixed MO. It doesn't, it's not going to change. 
So the result can be inappropriate pricing decisions and even a product discontinuation decision. We might look at a product and think that it's not profitable because we've attached all this fixed mo to it, maybe in a slow period. And um, it's gonna lead us to potentially make some bad decisions. So we move on to segmented income statement, and we need to understand the idea of traceable fixed costs versus common fixed costs. So when we say segment, a segment is any part or activity of an organization about which we might see cost revenue or profit data. So if we're looking at a business overall, we could segment it by individual locations, each individual store. Uh, we could segment by different service centers. Uh, we could segment by different products or services that we provide. We could segment it geographically by territory or region. So a lot of different ways that we can segment. Um, so we can be a little bit creative when it comes to what does it mean to segment. But uh, here we're gonna look at, I think, two different products within a company. Um, as we do this, there's two keys to building segmented income statements. First, a contribution format should be used. Great, we've been focusing on contribution format and variable costing. So we're gonna be separating our fixed costs from variable cost, and that's gonna enable the calculation of contribution margin. And then today we'll learn segment margin, which is a similar idea. Traceable fixed costs should be separated from common fixed costs to enable the calculation of segment margin. So again, we'll learn segment margin here shortly. Um, it's a similar concept to contribution margin. So when we say a traceable fixed cost, a traceable fixed cost arises because of the existence of that particular segment and it would disappear either immediately or over time if that segment disappeared. So they offer this example, the salary of the Fritos project product manager at PepsiCo is traceable fixed cost of the Fritos business segment at Pepsi. So if we got rid of that segment, would we continue to pay the salary of that manager? No, we don't need that role anymore. Um, the maintenance cost for the building in which Boeing 747s are assembled is a traceable fixed cost of the 747 business segment of Boeing. So that cost is traceable to that product. If we get rid of that product, do we still need that the, that building and that maintenance cost? Probably not. It's probably going to go away over time. So a common fixed cost is one that arises because of the overall operation of the company and would not disappear if a particular segment were eliminated. So like the salary of the CEO at General Motors is a common fixed cost. So even if we decided to stop making a particular car or close down a given plant, um, we would still have the salary of the CEO. It's not gonna go away. Uh, the cost of heating a Safeway or a Kroger, a grocery store, is a common fixed cost of the various departments. So even if we decide to stop selling flowers or we decide that we're not going to have a bakery anymore, we still have a common fixed cost, which is heating and air conditioning at the grocery store. So it's not gonna go away based on one given department. So traceable fixed costs. It's important to realize that traceable fixed costs of one segment may be common fixed costs of another segment. So again, remember a segment is any unit that we might seek cost uh, cost profit data about. So we can resegment in different ways. So here they give an interesting example. Uh, the landing fee paid to land an airplane at an airport is traceable to that particular flight. So if we were segmenting costs by flight, that landing fee would be traceable to that flight. But if we were to resegment and we were to look at our data by passenger class, first class versus business class versus economy class, that landing fee 
is not traceable to any given class. It would be a common fixed cost if we were to segment by passenger class, but it's a traceable fixed cost if we're, if we're segmenting by flight. So the point is that depending on how we segment, one cost could be traceable in one regard and common if we were to look at it in another way. So each time we need to reconsider is this cost fixed, excuse me, is this cost traceable fixed or common fixed? So the segment margin is computed by subtracting the traceable fixed cost of a segment from its contribution margin. So traditionally, if we were to look at a variable costing income statement, we'd take sales minus variable costs equals contribution margin, and then we'd subtract our fixed costs and we'd arrive at our net operating income. Here, we're gonna compute our segment margin by subtracting those traceable costs from the contribution margin. So we'll take a look at what that looks like on an income statement momentarily. Here's a friendly, gentle reminder, don't allocate common costs to segments. Um, sometimes this can be tempting in that we think, well, you know, there's two segments and let's just divide up the common fixed costs among the two segments because, you know, somebody's got to cover them. So we'll just break them up evenly. When we feel tempted to allocate, that should be a sign that we're doing it wrong. Um, we shouldn't have to allocate. If it can't be traced directly to that segment, then don't do it. Just let it remain as a common fixed cost. So we're going to look at Weber Inc. They've got two divisions, the computer division and the television division. That's kind of a mouthful. I'm going to say TV division. Um, so we're going to look more closely at the TV division's income statement. So we see sales minus variable COGS and then other variable expenses. So that's a total of 150,000 in total variable expenses. So we've got a contribution margin of 150,000. And then we subtract our fixed expenses, and specifically they label them traced, excuse me, traceable fixed expenses, and we arrive at our division margin, which is another term for segment margin. Um, so it's really the same thing as our regular contribution format income statement. We took sales minus variable, and we arrive at our contribution margin. We subtract fixed, and we previously would call it net operating income. Now, we re now we're referring to it as our division or our segment margin. Okay, so that's our segment margin, comes out to $60,000. So that segment margin represents the television division's contribution to the overall company profit. So when we put it with the rest of the company, we've got the television division that we just looked at with $60,000, and we have the computer division, and they have a segment margin of $40,000. So we have a combined segment margin of $100,000. Then we subtract the common fixed expenses of $25,000, and we arrive at our net operating income of $75,000. Now, some would feel tempted to allocate out the 25,000 to the two different divisions. But again, common fixed expenses should not be allocated to the divisions. These expenses would remain even if one of the divisions were eliminated. And what we'll find out soon is that erroneously allocating them to the segments where they don't belong can lead us to make bad decisions. It's important just to leave them as common fixed expenses and to understand that if we made the decision to get rid of the television segment or the computer segment, that we'd still be stuck with $25,000 of fixed expenses. We can't make it go away by eliminating one of these segments. Well, that's kind of what I just said, right? As previously mentioned, fixed expenses that are traceable to one segment can become common fixed expenses if the company is divided into smaller segments. So if we look at Weber a little bit deeper, within the TV division, we've got two product lines, the regular TV and the big screen TV, very sophisticated. So 
we're further breaking down this segment, the television division, now into two products, so separate segmenting there. So we're looking at our regular and our big screen. And for regular, we've got a product line margin, so another, a smaller segment margin of 60,000. And then big screen, we have a product line margin of 10,000. So altogether, we've got 70,000 in product line margin. And here they're pointing out, we still have the same amount of fixed costs. However, 80,000 of it is considered traceable to the products. And then the other 10,000 remains as common. So we've got $90,000 in fixed costs, but Part of it, 80,000 of it is traceable to products, 10 remains common to the division. So again, when we segment differently, what used to be a common fixed cost now might become a traceable fixed cost. So once we have our segmented income statement, we can then use that for decision making and we can even perform break even analysis. However, it's break-even analysis with a little bit of a twist. So here we're looking at our television division and we've got our two products segmented out, regular and big screen. And they're showing us, okay, well, if we spend another $5,000 on additional advertising, that would be an additional common fixed expense. We're hoping that will result in a 5% increase in sales and we can see what that does to each of our segments. And so our overall division margin of the television division increases by 2,500 up to 60, 62,500. But the key is that this is a common fixed expense. So these, these traceable fixed costs stayed the same and they shared in that advertising cost. But this segmented format using variable cost, excuse me, using contribution format um, allows us to see what that's going to do to each of our product lines. So again, using cost volume profit analysis from chapter five in conjunction with segmented income statements, uh, we can project what will happen to our products and to our segmented division as a whole. So what about break even points? So overall, this was the company. We've got our television and our computer divisions. We've got traceable fixed costs of 170,000, common fixed costs of 25,000, and net operating income of 75,000. So clearly we're operating above break even, but how do we compute break even in this type of environment when we're segmenting. So first we're gonna take a look at our company-wide break-even point. And we can compute that by taking the sum of our traceable fixed costs and our common fixed costs. So the 170 traceable and the 25 common fixed cost. And we're gonna divide it by our CM ratio. Our CM ratio. So going back the CM ratio, we're taking 270 and we're dividing it by 500,000. So 270 divided by 500,000, we compute our, our CM ratio of 0.54. So we're taking our fixed costs divided by our CM ratio, and we come up with a break-even point of 361,111. Does that make sense? So the sales would be significantly lower, go down to 361,111, and this would therefore end at zero. That this would assume that we're keeping the same sales mix, the same relative proportion of television to computer sales. So um, is that realistic? Maybe, maybe not. So we can look at our break-even point a different way by looking at our break-even point for each business segment. In this case, um, we'll look at our break-even for television versus computer. So now we're taking our traceable fixed expense by segment and dividing it by our CM ratio. Okay, so our CM ratio for the television division, we're taking 150,000 CM 
our contribution margin and dividing it by our sales. So 150 over 300, we're getting 0.5 as our CM ratio. So we take the 90,000 of traceable fixed expenses, we divide it by 0.5, and we get a break even of 180,000. We do the same for the computer division. So we're taking $80,000 in traceable fixed expenses and we're dividing it by our CM ratio, which we computed by taking our contribution margin divided by our sales dollars, and we got 0.6. So when we divide, we get 133,333. But question for you, if we sell $180,000 of televisions and $133,333 of computers, that's going to make the division margin zero. But will the company be at zero? We're still going to have common fixed expenses of 25,000. So what do you think our net operating income will be? They're noting here, notice the $25,000 of company-wide common fixed expenses are excluded from the segment break-even calculations because the common fixed expenses are not traceable to the segments and are not influenced by segment level decisions. So what's going to happen is that this 25,000 was not factored in and therefore at what we believe is break even, break even for each of the two divisions, we're still going to end up with 25,000 more in expenses and therefore net operating income of minus 25,000. So a net loss of 25,000 at what was hypothetically a break-even point. I will let one of our amazing groups presenting their case study explore that concept a little more fully when they present their case study project in the near future. Um, this slide is talking about all of the costs that make up the value chain. So when we think about the cost of a given segment, they're suggesting that we need to consider the company's entire value chain from start to finish, um, which can go all the way back to research and development, which is R&D, product design, manufacturing, marketing, distribution, and customer service. So that's what they mean by the value chain. Um, that's about all you need to know on that topic is to what's included. A lot of what we look at here in uh, managerial accounting, we essentially start here with the manufacturing of the product and then we sell it. So we kind of focus in on manufacturing and distribution, but in the real world, we might need to consider all of these functions within the value chain. When we talk about our fixed costs, I mentioned previously that we shouldn't be tempted to allocate out what are common fixed costs. So here's two points. Failure to trace our costs directly can be problematic. Costs that can be traced directly to specific segments of a company should not be allocated over to other segments. If we can trace it, we should trace it. But then that leads us to the other side of that. If we feel like we have to mathematically allocate it in some way, then we probably shouldn't. So some companies allocate costs to segments using arbitrary bases. Costs should be allocated to segments only when the allocation base actually drives the cost being allocated. If we just decide, well, you know, we've got all these fixed costs and we have four stores, so let's just divide everything by four and assign it to the four stores. That's pretty arbitrary. If we get rid of one of those stores, will we still have the same amount of fixed costs? So we need to be really thoughtful if we find ourselves tempted to mathematically allocate out our fixed costs. So common costs and segments. Common costs should not be arbitrarily allocated to segments based on the rationale that, well, someone has to cover it. Um, that doesn't work. Two reasons why. This practice can make a profitable business segment appear to be unprofitable. And we'll look at a, an example of that shortly here. And secondly, allocating common fixed costs forces managers to be held accountable for costs that they really don't have any control over. Um, so let's take a look at this example. We have Hoagland's Lakeshore, which includes a bar and a restaurant segment. 
So overall, if I look at their company, they've got $800,000 in sales minus variable expenses of $310,000 and a contribution margin of $490. We subtract our traceable fixed costs that come from each of the two segments, $26,000 for bar, $220,000 for restaurant, and we arrive at a segment margin of $244,000. And then we subtract common fixed expenses of $200,000 and we arrive at net operating profit of 44,000. So if we take a quick look at this, we see a company that have, they're still making money, they have net operating profit of 44,000, but it's not fantastic considering 800,000 in sales. And it looks like the restaurant is making significantly more in dollars than the bar. So one might glance at this and say that the restaurant's doing well and the bar's not so much. So, if we think about it, how much of the common fixed expense of 200,000 can be avoided by eliminating the bar? So going back, if we just get rid of the bar, how much of this 200,000 is gonna be eliminated? I'm hoping that you chose A, none of it. Common fixed expenses are not going to be eliminated by dropping one of the segments. So knowing that, let's look at the next question. Suppose that square feet is used as the basis for allocating the common fixed expense of 200,000. How much would be allocated to the bar if the bar occupies 1,000 square feet and the restaurant occupies 9,000 square feet? So that's 10,000 square feet total of which the bar occupies 1 tenth, right? So how much are we going to allocate to the bar? I'm hoping you came up with 20,000. So you took one tenth of the 200,000. 1,000 out of 10,000 square feet is one tenth of the 200,000. So that's 20,000. Now I do want to comment before we move on. Something doesn't feel right. If we're having to do all this math and allocation of fixed expenses, we should be questioning this. It's really not okay, but this, this example is showing us why it's not okay. So we decide to allocate $20,000 to the bar. What is that going to look like? So if Hoagland's allocates its common fixed expenses to the bar and the restaurant, what would be the reported profit of each segment? Let me go back real quick to their income statement here. So instead of putting 200,000 here as common fixed expense, we would spread this out and put 20,000 more as a fixed expense of the bar and 180,000 as a fixed expense of the restaurant. If we subtract 20,000 from the bar, now the bar's going negative, right? So somebody might look at this and say, wow, the bar's losing money. This isn't good. So here's what happens. If we subtract the common fixed expenses that we've allocated out, the bar is now at negative 6,000 and the restaurant's at 50,000. So a manager could look at this and say, you know what, the bar's just losing money. Let's just get rid of the bar. Is that good? Well, first of all, I can tell you from my experience working in the restaurant industry, getting rid of the bar is not a good idea, period. The bar generates a lot of income. So that's a bad idea just from my professional experience. But what we see here on paper, if we get rid of the bar, a manager might think, well, that's losing us money. But what happens to this $20,000 of common fixed expense? Is it actually going to go away? And the answer, of course, is no. It's just going to be reallocated to the restaurant. So do you think the bar should be eliminated? I'm hoping you figured that out. No, because here's what happens. They actually make $14,000 less. Remember, the segment margin of the bar was $14,000. That is their contribution to the company's overall profits. Now the 200,000 has been all allocated to the restaurant and we don't have the benefit of the $14,000 segment margin from the bar. So getting rid of the bar 
caused the overall net operating income to drop by 14,000. So that was a bad idea. Do you see how dangerous it could be to allocate out that common fixed expense though? Uh, a business manager who doesn't remember what they learned in managerial accounting could easily make that mistake. Well, somebody's got to cover those common fixed expenses and we can allocate it out based on square footage. And that could potentially lead to a very dangerous decision to eliminate the bar. What we see is that that does not help. So what we've learned is that we definitely need to focus in on variable costing. And as we're doing our segment margin, it's important to continue using variable costing. But circling back to absorption costing versus variable costing, a couple of important notes. Both US GAAP and IFRS, so our international standards and our US standards, both require absorption costing for external reports. So financial statements to the readers, the investors, the creditors, what a company puts in their 10K annual report. They want them to use absorption costing. Does that bother you? It bothers me because earlier we were talking about how simply producing more units, we could manipulate our net income. That sounds a little bit scary to me for the readers of financial statements that may not understand absorption costing versus variable costing. We explored the idea that under absorption costing, we could be operating at less than break even, yet still show a positive net income depending on the situation. And again, I find that to be scary for the readers of financial statements. They say, since absorption costing is required for external reporting, most companies also use it for internal reports rather than incurring the additional cost of maintaining a separate variable costing system for internal reporting. Well, I understand that maintaining a whole separate accounting system, a separate variable costing system could be burdensome, but I think I would at least run some calculations in Excel or on the back of a napkin before making decisions. Um, I think keeping an eye on our variable costing and understanding our variable costing uh, unit product cost is really critical to making good management decisions. So I think it's definitely something that a business manager needs to be thoughtful about, even if it requires a little bit of extra work. A little bit of extra work to avoid, avoid making bad financial decisions is well worth it. So going back variable versus absorption, absorption costing says fixed manufacturing costs must be assigned to products to properly match revenues and costs. Oh, now they're hitting my soft spot because they know how I love the matching concept. But they're saying, okay, we need to match the fixed mo to the revenue that it generates, which is the product. When we sell the product, then we expense the fixed mo. Variable costing, on the other hand, says well, fixed mo are actually capacity costs, or I could explain it as costs of that period, and will be incurred even if nothing is produced. So I could go to, back to the matching concept and say, well, we need to expense it in the period in which it's incurred. So really, I could use the matching concept to argue absorption or variable costing. It's really a matter of perspective. Is fixed mo a cost of the period, or is it a cost of the product? And there's strong arguments for both. I just hope now that you see the dangers of using only absorption costing and not taking a look at the variable costing approach. So going back to GAAP and IFRS, um, they say that uh, publicly traded companies are required to include segmented financial data in their annual reports. Companies must report segmented results to shareholders using the same methods that are used for internal segmented reports. Uh-oh, that's going to be a little bit problematic. If we've been using variable costing internally to do segmented reports, now we have to report that to shareholders under the same methods. So this requirement motivates managers to avoid using the contribution approach for internal reporting purposes, because if they did, they would have to A, share the sensitive data with the public in their financial reports, and B, ooh, this is a pain, reconcile these reports with applicable rules for consolidated reporting purposes. So 
what we learn here. Oh, these are burdensome rules, and the rules do not really support doing quality accounting internally to make decisions. It feels like everything's working against us, telling us not to use variable costing, telling us not to focus in on the contribution approach, even though that's what we've learned over the past couple chapters is the best in terms of making decisions. So this is definitely tricky for publicly traded companies that are required to share those internal segmented reports. Um, some of them are gonna choose to do that and some are not, which I think is a little bit messy. I'm, in my opinion, I think GAP and IFRS need to reconsider some of these rules, but that's just me. Nobody listens to me. I'm just the accounting professor. So um, that's chapter six, you guys. I hope that you've learned the difference between variable costing and absorption costing approaches that you understand how to compute unit product cost and you understand the purpose of segmented uh, income statement and how to use that. All right, good luck with chapter six. Let me know how I can help you.